a businessman, a family man, a philanthropist, an Alaskan television and social icon. Good evening, I'm John Thompson, and tonight we're going to pull the curtain back on the Mattress Ranch guy, Ted Sadler. Well, thank you very much for joining us tonight. My name is John Thompson. We're going to tell you over the course of the next hour an incredible story of the Mattress Ranch guy, Ted Sadler. Now, you know him as local business guy, loves to dance, loves to jive, loves to talk on television and tell you about the great mattresses. He's also a philanthropist, Food Bank of Alaska, and of course, cystic fibrosis, a cause that he cares so much about, always trying to get the word out. But the man has had a very dynamic life and a very long career, working very, very hard. It all started at the beginning as a young boy, hitchhiking across the country, and now, well, he's pretty much the guy, the mattress king of the state of Alaska, an iconic businessman in the state of Alaska. But that comes after years of building that. And uh, there have always been some questions. There's always been some concerns, always been rumors regarding Ted Sadler. Tonight, you're going to hear it straight from the man's mouth himself. For the next hour, the fall, the rise, the fall, the rise of Ted Sadler. Please enjoy. Ted always had a wanderlust. As a young child exploring the sewer systems of Levittown, New Jersey, a new suburban development aimed at helping World War II veterans find affordable housing outside of cramped central city locations. Now that was 1958, when a young Ted was introduced to development in front of his very eyes. They were building this big, monstrous uh, complex of homes, tens of thousands of homes, every day completing five homes, 10 homes, and they built a sewer system that went all the way around. There was no sewage in it. So for two years, myself and the two girls that I hung around with spent our time following them and see where they come up and then trying to get back home. The future Mattress King had a raw craving for adventure, started hitchhiking at the age of seven or eight, proficient by 12 or 13, developing a love of road travel and seeing new sights, but that also delivered Ted life lessons in dealing with and communicating with people, lessons that serve him still today. People were different then. People were um, courteous. People knew that you were young. They'd ask you, do you need work? Do you need food? Whatever. And um, uh, it was a lot of fun. It wasn't like it is today. And it's probably hard for anybody that's not 100 years old like me to imagine that. Young Ted met his wife while working for a hotel casino. Ted was the front desk guy, and Susan was an operator with the phone company. Entertainers would stay there, Arthur Godfrey, Milton Berle, all the old time, and she would take their time and charges, and then I would charge it to the room. So I'd talk to her, and then she'd say, hey, I just talked to somebody from Thule Greenland. I thought, heck, I want to go to Thule Greenland, so I did. Susan would call me all over the country wherever I went, and then I'd tell her stories, and we got to be friends. It was a natural love, and Susan really drove Ted. They were married in 1968, and she said she'd quit the phone company until Ted learned how to hold down a job after he shuffled through six jobs in four years. The first day that I got married, a friend of mine called me and said, hey, over on 34th Street, there's a chest. Well, I jammed it in the trunk of my car, but I sold it before I got home, and I made 15 bucks or whatever. I can't, I can't remember what the number was, but uh, in those days, they were paying us a dollar an hour to work. So that was 15 hours of work. I knew the next day that I had to get up. So my wife and I got up, learned the trash, two different trash routes, and we followed them every day, and we followed them six days a week. The couple opened their first used furniture business on the first anniversary of marriage, with the store in New Jersey eventually expanding into Pennsylvania. Ted made more money then per money than he ever made in his life, well, because there was no cost. Ted would sell to dealers and put money in his pocket. It was 50 years ago and Ted was raking in $900 a month, a big deal back then. And with that early success, he and Susan were smart and frugal with their earnings. They'd live in the store and alternate showers at each other's parents' houses. Despite being worth millions of dollars, the same is still true today. Ted and his family have a beautiful home in Arizona, but they spend most of their time at home in their loft above the Port Orchard Mattress Ranch. By the end of two months, I'd, re I'd bought a trailer, uh, had the store full of uh, inventory, and um, it just kept going like that. Ted built an empire on hunger, hard work, and hustle. Today, the word hustle doesn't have the same thought that it did then. Hustling to me means that you're going to do anything to make it. I carried bricks. I did everything that there was, moving and hauling. Um, anything somebody came in the, ha in the store and said they needed done, I told them I could do it. I can do anything if I try. 
Graduating from the School of Hard Knocks with a PhD in hustle and a positive attitude, plus confidence growing daily, Wanderlust was starting to kick in. Ted sold his furniture store to a relative in New Jersey, but that was his first experience of being truly humbled. The relative never paid Ted. Once you're over it, you realize, hey, that was a learning experience and gave me the ability to get into something with partners that I know, trust, love, um, and that feel the same about me. Um, it's not that same way about the whole world. So uh, family's pretty big to me. You and your wife from the East Coast, how did you get over to the West Coast? How did we get to Washington and Alaska? Because, you know, your house is <laughs> in, in the state of Alaska. The logic isn't really there, though, as to how. Um, I had uh, hitchhiked up to Alaska. I worked for O'Neill Investigations. I worked for Dan Cuddy at First National Bank. I respected these two men beyond anything. And for some reason, the years, the few years that passed after that, I always wanted to go back and emulate those two people. While Ted was happy to see his company carrying on and growing, he felt dejected. His feelings were hurt. It was 1971, and Ted decided to travel north to Alaska with his wife, Susan, and infant son, Max. Looking for a new start in the last frontier, and Alaska was about to boom. With six grand in his pocket, Ted arrived in Anchorage, hitting up the local auctions, specifically Pacific Avenue and Mountain View, buying furniture, and then standing on a street corner to resell it. He would continue that process, nose to the grind, and the success would eventually follow. I was doing $2 million the second year I was in uh, Anchorage. So um, uh, I went from, I parlayed that 6000 uh, and then a, a factory came up and said, hey man, you sell this stuff like it's water, what do you do? I said, I give the customer a fair deal. Staying away from the gimmicks and the big sales, Ted Sadler built an empire on the foundation of treating people right and paying his bills. It's all about responsibility. I was in my early 30s and a multimillionaire and, and strutting. Um, I'm not the same person I was then, and I hope the people that I made the stupid decisions with back then who, who see this can say, hey, that man grew up with time. With the Alaska oil boom of the 70s and early 80s, Sadler was booming too. He opened Sadler's, his name minus the T because people had a hard time pronouncing it, and he had tremendous success in Anchorage, Sterling, Fairbanks, and Wasilla. The furniture king was thriving in some wild times while learning the art of marketing from local juggernauts like Jerry Grilly of the Anchorage Daily News and Al Bramstead Jr. of a local TV station. It was wild days, crazy stuff. Crazy days, wild stuff. The guy, the guy told me, he said, if you brought up 100 mattresses, I'll buy them. So I bought 100 mattresses, shipped them up, and he bought them. I shook hands with them, and I walked away. Uh, everybody that I dealt with up there in those days paid me. Um, it was uh, different than today and paid in sometimes unorthodox ways. Some, uh, I got a piece of real estate from a guy who went broke and he said, Ted, I can't pay any, any way but this. We turned the property over and it was worth three times what, I, what he owed me. I'd have given him more money back if he had said something to me. I didn't actually realize until years later what, how good he was to me. With Ted riding the waves of success, the young millionaire was about to crash letting ego and inexperience propel him into some bad investments and business decisions. More on the Mattress Ranch guy, Ted Sadler, the rise, the fall, and the rise again when we return. Hi, Ted Sadler. Well, as you have discovered, Ted Sadler, a very adventurous man. He's got a bit of the wanderlust, loves to be driving as a young age. He was hitchhiking around the country, uh, going through sewer systems and, and seeing where they pop up. He just loves exploring, eventually came up to Alaska, where he was wildly successful starting the Sadler's Home Furniture brand, opening stores all over the state. But all good things sometimes must come to an end. Lessons have to be learned. Ted Sadler was about to learn a very big lesson. Ted was on top of the world, a millionaire in his 30s. Right place, right time, he built a furniture empire during a time of great riches and prosperity in Alaska. But as recession loomed for the state, about 10 years after establishing Sadler's, Ted turned to real estate and other investment opportunities. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. It's, um, I just tried to build, tried to build, tried to build. I thought I was going to be a land merchant. I thought I was going to build uh, shopping centers. Um, I had all kinds of young man visions, just not the ability nor the mentality to handle it. 
I don't have that personality. I'm a starter of small business. A lot of money was borrowed as Ted's dreams were bigger than the 49th state. With the recession of the 80s, Ted lost it all and became a liability to the Sadler's brand, which he created. Understanding that ultimately he was responsible, Ted fell on the sword for his business. There's only one person guilty getting you into that. I borrowed the money because people would lend me money. I didn't know that it was too much money and I couldn't pay it back. So I was one of those stupid people during the pipeline era that thought it would go on and on, and it did. My business never lost sales. I've not been in a business that the sales went back. I've been in a business that I had too big a head for and thought that I should own the world rather than just being happy with what I was doing. A hard lesson was learned, no longer worth millions. Ted paid off his creditors and gave the Sadler's business to Dave Cavett, a man who worked his way up from a delivery driver to partner, eventually becoming a furniture mogul in Anchorage. Cavett and his wife Rachel owned Furniture Enterprises of Alaska. The person that I uh, gave it to had the capability to do it, and also the banks have to punish somebody. So I had to be punished. I gave up all the money, all my assets, everything. Nobody ever sued me, never went to court, never had a... I, I don't think I had real harsh words with very many people, but they peeled me like a potato. And I set myself up for it because I realized that I could save the company by taking the assets down. Payments that were $20,000 for Ted would only be around eight grand for the new owner. Sadler wanted to see continued success for his employees and for the brand that he built that carried his name minus the T. A deal was made with Dave Cabot that would see Ted leave Alaska. I made a verbal deal that I would not bother or come back to Alaska and I was promised a large amount, of, a large sum of money if I would wait the 15 years and not came back. From a millionaire to being worth $12,000, Ted moved back to Washington and started hustling again, this time as a man of a certain age. From 40 to 60, I was on a delivery truck. Oh yeah, it hurt. It hurt every day. It hurt. I knew I made a mistake uh, every day by walking away from it and uh, not wanting to fight it out. In Washington, Ted tried his hand at furniture stores again, but he would ultimately shift towards mattress sales. Building himself back up, he looked forward to the 15-year anniversary of leaving Alaska when he'd be able to collect on that lucrative payout. On the 15th year, I was promised the money, and then I was told that I couldn't get the money because it would be restraint of trade that I wouldn't be allowed to come back to Alaska if he was to give me the money. So he refused to give me the money. That day I put my house up for sale and I spent all the money on advertising. With a fire burning in his belly and 15 more years of sweat and experience under his cap, a return to Alaska was inevitable. Ted Sadler bet the farm on Mattress Ranch and even he couldn't predict the success to come. Hi, Ted Sadler. Well, you saw the rise of Ted Sadler. You saw the fall of Ted Sadler. Man, and he was a little bit bitter about that. We did have a conversation. Obviously, years have passed and things are okay now, but uh, one of the reasons he did come back to Alaska was to prove a point that he could be successful, thrive in Alaska. He has more than proved that point, and it kind of just fell into him doing something that he really loves and something that he really believes in. Ted Sadler, salt of the earth kind of guy. Let's talk about the re-rise of the man, Ted Sadler. I went to Alaska as a child and I developed that furniture store that I had up there for years. I made lots of money. I got to be a fat cat, thought I was Mr. Invincible. The guy that was running it realized that I wasn't Mr. Invincible and he could do a better job at it. So I said, hey, take it over. It's yours. Let's end this. And he did a better job. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Well, I came down here thinking that I had the same ability to do the same thing in a short amount of time. It took me 17 years here to break the ice. Once I broke the ice, it wasn't a problem, but I had to fight for 17 years. After leaving Alaska with $12,000 in the bank, no debt but hurt pride, Ted and his wife Susan opened a high-end furniture store in Bremerton, Washington. The next several years were spent opening and closing down stores, truly starting from the bottom and looking failure in the face before eventually getting out of the furniture business altogether. I can't sell something that I don't believe in. I believe that the majority of the furniture business is hype 
and that um, good, better, best is still what we need today. In the furniture business, you're selling shine. So face it, you know, you got waterfalls, you've got um, aisles that are uh, wide as can be. Who's paying for that space? You know how much your house costs? Can you imagine? When you're inside of one of these big monster stores, take a walk around and say, well, my house would fit over here and they got 10,000 of them. How much does that cost? Understanding that the quality of foreign made furniture was decreasing with the high cost of business, Ted realized that a change needed to be made. I wanted something that uh, was economical to operate out of, efficient to operate out of, and that gave a consumer a value. Because I'm embarrassed to, to um, sell something that I wouldn't put my family on. With family and product quality becoming the new business model for Ted, he enlisted the help of his 19-year-old son, Max, signing him to a one-year contract to make sure that Max would keep his nose clean and work hard. Uh, they uh, abandoned me up in Alaska when I was about 17 years old, uh, although the story might be that I was a kind of a butt and didn't want to come down. But uh, I, I wound up uh, getting in a little bit of trouble up there and had to, to, to come back and, uh, to mommy and daddy, and I figured I'd work with them for a while until something better came along, and it's been about 25 years now. Nothing better has come along, so it must be working out. In rebuilding his business and his brand, Ted had to rebuild himself, falling back on the basics, which delivered much success when Max was a young boy. Sesame Street said when I was a kid with my son that if you walk down the street with your head up high and the look of confidence in your eye, you can do anything if you try. And it's really true. But the other thing is you better have a computer guy right alongside it, and you better have another technician over here, and then you can walk through the world doing whatever you want. But you have to believe you can do it first. Great words of advice as Ted and his wife Susan rebuilt the empire, relying on his son Max to buy in as well. I learned a, quite a bit uh, from him just by uh, being on the job. Um, all those years of, uh, of labor and, and trying to save as much money as possible and do everything ourselves to keep uh, the costs as low as possible, I learned how to do everything and more importantly learned that there's nothing that I can't figure out how to do if I want to go do it. In the 17 years it took Ted to rebuild his brand, he also worked on rebuilding his relationship with Max. With Family Strong, the future mattress king, well, he needed a product that he saw value in and, of course, a good marketing campaign to promote it. Ted would connect with another local businessman who saw his fair share of troubles, mattress factory owner John Larson. Excited at the prospect of doing one thing and doing it well, Ted and John made a deal, seeing Larson's Sound Sleep Corporation produce a mattress brand exclusively to Mattress Ranch. Instead of selling name brand mattresses produced overseas, Ted was selling a product produced in Washington and saving money on the 30% franchise fee that he would have had to pay the top companies. Nobody's going to get sick on any mattress that they buy from me. Anything that they buy from me has been thoroughly tested and passed every single test that there is or we don't sell it. We do not sell imports of any kind or uh, the, the imports are not being inspected like we are. Well, hello, John, come on in. The biggest reason I can sell for less is my relationship with the factory. The factory was built as Mattress Ranch was built. As I grew, they added a machine. As I grew, they added another machine. We are the best at what we do because we work together the way we do. There is an inherent promise with every brand, whether it's Nike or Microsoft or whatever, is Ted's brand is come to my store, you'll find value, you'll find comfort, you'll find delivery, you'll find a welcome experience. And I've always admired that. Partnering up with Sound Sleep Products was one of the best decisions Ted ever made, giving him a product he could be proud of at a fair price. We don't mark it up to mark it down. It's sold. When I buy something, it's going out with a markup I have to have to survive. And if I don't have the markup, it doesn't go out. So um, it's pretty simple. Director of Business Development with Sleep Sound Products, Peter Horton, met Ted 35 years ago on a cold sales call at Ted Sadler's store in Mountain View. Well, you fast forward to today and the partnership is revolutionizing the mattress industry. They take materials recovered in the manufacturing process, the quilting, the trim, and the foam trim, which are all sent to Tacoma facility to be ground up and reintroduced into a pad, being reused as a comfort layer in a mattress. So we're recovering materials in process, reusing them, and into a finished product. So the benefit to the consumer is 
lower cost, the benefit to the, the world is it reduces our carbon footprint. We're reusing materials that we would normally scrap. The ingenuity between TED and SoundSleep products would eventually produce a machine unlike one the industry has ever seen. This is the roll pack machine. Watch what happens here. Isn't that fantastic? When we were shipping containers to Alaska, we now can get 25 to 30 percent more on by doing the roll pack. The roll pack saves everybody money and allows us to ship to anybody throughout the country. If you have a relative at any place and they need a mattress, just come on in, we'll ship it to them. With an amazing product and great partners, all Ted needed was a way to market his brand. He bought a few farm animals that got some attention from the locals in Washington, so he invested $30,000 on a sign, fencing, and produced and painted animals in a shed at his Port Orchard store. But the question on many people's minds was, why the mattress ranch? I had to figure out something that all mines were attracted to. So the first thing I'd like is mom, when she's riding down the street with her daughter or her son, to say, oh, look at that place. And then I want them to say, what is that place? And boy, that doesn't make any sense, that place. Hey, Ted, give us a tour. Love this place. John, man. I, this I am so excited. Let's walk around. I want to show you where all the little sheep come from. Everything, even those little mattresses. I love it. Come on, Please guys. Do. Please do. So, Ted, what, what is with the animals, my friend? I mean, they are gorgeous. They're I watch. I, up I live up there up top, and I watch people come in, and every day, that I put another animal out, another group would stop. Well, by the time I put a hundred out, there were a hundred groups stopping. And before we're done, I'll bet somebody comes by to take a picture. And I thought it was exciting. And that's the only answer. That's how it uh, got started. And then uh, we had this shed over here that we used to work out of, but I decided that uh, I wanted to paint out of it. And so we started painting animals by the hundreds. And I got too old. Arthritis and such doesn't allow me now, but um, that's, where they're all born and when you're looking out here in different places you can see right over there see where that loop is right there that's a queen size mattress you saw that didn't you okay and over there there's a twin size mattress and they're all being born out there and there's a mother mattress maker out there someplace we can't see her because she's hiding so that's basically why it's there. You're pulling back the curtain, Ted. Opening the curtain. You're opening the curtain. Well, what is it about colors? What, did you love coloring? Or oh, what, how did, how did you uh, I have an eighth grade education and did seventh twice. So I really didn't have much training onto anything, except I like to see happy kids. I like to see happy people. If they're smiling, hey, maybe they'll buy a mattress. Let's face it. <laughs> Sometimes I'm a, a, a ham as well as a turkey. There's a reason for everything, and the Mattress Ranch concept was born. Ted was about to make a triumphant return to Alaska. With a concept, a quality product, and advertising knowledge, Ted was on course to become more successful than he ever could have imagined as a millionaire in his 30s. Hi, Ted Sheridan Welcome back. I'm John Thompson telling you the mattress guy story. I mean, Ted Sadler, so many stories. I think we had to condense hours and hours and hours and hours. And then, of course, my personal conversations with the man into one hour. And it's just been a great hour so far. You've gotten to know the story, the rise, the fall, the re-rise of Ted Sadler, a man who's fallen down many times. But every time he does, he gets right back up. And we're going to take you to, well, what you may know him for most, the commercials, the Mattress Ranch commercials. How did they come about? What are they about? Thank you. Baseball is baseball. Yeah, you always have someone no, following you around the camera. All the time. Wow, that's impressive. Upwards of 18 cameras. Thank you. 18 uh, cameras. Thank you. Burn. Hi. Uh, <laughs> I, got a, I got a guy from Fox with a camera on there. Oh, too, so it's oh, you just got recognized. Yeah, it's pretty good. My daughter loved your commercial. Oh, okay. Can I get a picture of my wife? Of course. She would, she would just be uh, I would love to. Yeah. She'd be tickled. Oh, yes. Thank you. My honor. Right. Thank you. Hey, oh, I'm a ham. Know. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a glazed ham? Or a, glazed? a glazed, definitely. 
Thank you. Thank you. Ted is now an iconic figure in not only the business community, but celebrity status in the public. Whether it's a Starbucks in Washington, and Ted does love his double tall skinny vanilla lattes at Starbucks, or the Alaska State Fair, people are drawn to Ted. A big credit not only to his larger than life personality, but the effectiveness of marketing. Once Ted developed the Mattress Ranch concept and had the support of a local mattress manufacturer, he was waiting for the 15 year handshake deal with Dave Cavett to come to fruition. One million dollars would suit Ted and his new business in Washington well. Well, Dave told Ted that the million dollar deal was not to be. Ted sold his house, took all $98,000 that he owned, and invested in advertising in Alaska. He missed Alaska, felt the need to write the way that he left, and he wanted to stick it to the brand that carried his name, minus the T. Then when my wife said, you're never going to be content till you go back to Alaska, when, on the day that I turned 60, uh, I started Mattress Ranch and then built it to this. But I really built it this time with my son and my daughter-in-law and my wife where uh, I had been building things on my own and I'm a builder but I'm not a runner. I didn't have the capacity that the man that I turned the business over to has. It was 2004 and back to Alaska for Ted and his family, this time with a new business model in place. Ted took $98,000 and rolled the dice on a three-month make it or break it campaign in the last frontier. With prior business success, Ted was welcomed back by television account executives with open arms. He scoped out and stocked a property in Midtown Anchorage, flooded the market with television ads, and the rest is history. You know, Ted, your commercials, they're iconic. You got a great dance. The kids love your dance. I'm sure people come down to the, school, the store just to dance with you and your employees. How'd you come up with this dance? Tell us about the art of this dance. Every time that we did it, the guy that was in uh, Dave's position would say to me, uh, hey, that's uh, funny when you do it that way. It's funny when you say it. Um, it's funny when I twist the word or um, whatever. So like the dollar bills, uh, somebody said, somebody, an employee said, or somebody said, uh, hold up the money, they like that. Well, I realized the kids ask me all the time, is that real money? And I, and I asked them, I said, do you think I'm rich? And they go, yeah, you have all that money. Starting at five. I'm using the clock because I know how three. to do it. Yeah. Starting in three. Hi, this is Ted Saber, and a lot of people call me the dancing man, and I have no idea why. Every time I get on television, somebody says, are you the dancing man? And I say, no, I'm not the dancing man. I'm the wiggling man. If you're looking for comfort, where do you go? You go to Mattress Ranch. If you're looking for a price, where do you go? You go to Mattress Ranch. Remember, we have these mattresses in stock today, and I'll wiggle my way. So if you're looking for a mattress, come in the Mattress Ranch, and you'll be surprised. Price, quality, and here today. I'm six foot nine inches tall. When I stand next to anybody and anybody, uh, they realize that there's something different. Then I realize that if I twitch a little bit, that's even a little bit different. And then if I wear a funny little hat, that's a little different. Well, it all mushroomed into that and the belief from my family that we had to find something to, to interest the public. So each one of those added to the next one. The public was definitely interested. The gamble paid off. Ted's new venture, marketing campaign, and revenge plot were wildly successful, leading to stores opening in Wasilla, Soldatna, Fairbanks, pop-up stores in Juneau, and expansion in Washington. While Ted was captain of the ship, he credits those around him with the unparalleled success of not only the business, but the marketing. Without partners and without the right employees, um, it doesn't work. Um, no, nobody like me can succeed, and people like me weren't meant to run something. They were meant to kickstart others and to help them believe what they can do, because I look at you and know that you can do it. Um, you look at yourself sometimes and say, well, geez, I don't know if I can handle that. I know you can, and I see it all the time when I look at people, but they got to get off their ass. Ted's the brand. <laughs> I mean, you can't go anywhere. If I tell somebody I work for a mattress ranch and they go, tell me about Ted, please tell me about Ted. Is he really like that all the time? Yes, he's really like that all the time. Ted's daughter-in-law, Yvonne, plays a big role in day-to-day -day operations as well as keeping Ted in check on set. Someone's got to keep Ted in check. Start, uh, or she's going to start the rest of the script and then at the end we'll um, think of something to, say. Something to close okay. it out with, okay? You want me here? 
Yeah, same place. Now, you actually help influence a lot of the commercials, or you're there with him when he's filming the commercials? Or I'm just there for support. Support. Yeah, yeah. We'll bounce each other thing off, uh, off of each other um, and ideas, and we'll throw out phrases, and, and we'll just go from there, see what happens. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. And so, so, it, so it really is, because I know we get to sit in on the on the creative process tomorrow morning, which we're very, <laughs> very much looking forward to doing. But um, what, what is your thoughts on the creative process? So it is just seriously sit around and, and have That's some it. fun and talk That's and it. see what you shoot it. That's it. Somebody will say something and we'll all just be having a conversation and somebody will say a phrase, say a word, and it'll get one of us going, hey, wait a minute, why don't we try it this way? Or how about saying it this way instead? Um, it might make more sense this way. Cool. There's actually not a whole lot to the creative process other than having a conversation. With all that Ted learned over the course of his life, his ability to market and tap into his strengths really helped build the Mattress Ranch. At an age when most consider retirement, Ted used creativity and strategic advertising to reinvent himself. The television to me is my partner. Uh, I encourage others to do the same because of the most success that I've got out of it. I also encourage you to pay your light bill. If you don't pay your light bill, you're not going to be in business. It's pretty simple. All of these things are not, um, uh, advertising is part of business, and if you don't advertise, you will not be successful. Um, and for me, the TV is the best uh, way to go. After multiple falls and multiple rises, Ted has finally honed in on the perfect formula. Be strategic, have faith in yourself, produce quality, love what you do and do it with family. Ted is once again on top of the world, the epitome of the American dream. And to quote the American dream, Dusty Rhodes, who recently passed away, he's wined and dined with kings and queens and slept in alleys eating pork and beans. That's Ted Sadler. With the wild success and faith in Max and Yvonne running the business, Ted was able to turn to philanthropy. You'll hear the stories of the causes Ted champions coming up. Now we all know Ted is a marketing genius. He loves his family. He has an incredible story of personal triumph, fall, personal triumph. But did you know how much he cares about just certain causes, giving back to humanity. And there are certain things that tug at his heartstrings. You're about to find out what charities he invests most in, what he believes in, why he believes those ways, and just really the honest reason for all the philanthropy. Ted Sadler is a philanthropist above all. Check it out. I have a, a following that is beyond, um, uh, I don't know how to say it, but uh, sometimes I have a dozen kids want to hug me, want to hold me, want to kiss me all at the same time. Uh, I, I love it. I absolutely love it. With Ted's success, the opportunity to reach out into the community presented itself. People were enamored with the larger-than-life personality, fun commercial jingle, and iconic dance. Ted was able to use his powers for good. Business reputation in Alaska rebuilt and an opportunity to connect with the families. I don't know if you know the story about when I worked the fairs. In the old days, I call it working the fairs. I stayed from the uh, time they opened in the morning till the time they closed, and I had a booth with cystic fibrosis and the people from cystic fibrosis and people brought up their kids to me and they took pictures with me all day long, all day. Um, some, it was as much as 12 hours a day. Uh, I got uh, three times kids wet on me in one day. Uh, I started taking clothes spare clothes so I could do it. With a smile on his face, I had to ask Ted, what do you feel was the most rewarding moment in your professional life? One of those days. One of those days when I stood by the school bus and I slapped hands with all the kids that got off the bus. And a lot of you kids out there are going to remember this day. Uh, there were hundreds of them, not just 10. It was fun, absolute fun. Ted loves fun, but Ted also gets serious when it comes to charities that he champions. People may see the commercials that Ted does to raise awareness for texting and driving, food banks, and cystic fibrosis, but people may not realize just how much those causes mean to Ted. Cystic fibrosis is such a horrible disease. It's the worst of anything that I know of. I know of nothing worse. And um, I fell in love with two uh, young ladies that had it or have it fell in love with them and uh, that was the reason and then the deeper I got into it and then I understood how 
uh, uncurable it is at the moment. It is getting better and life is getting better. I had a lady today that had cystic fibrosis that I did a commercial with this morning. And um, uh, I know better than most what they go through. I still today pray um, for that cure to come about. Philanthropy is a huge deal for Ted Sadler. Now, yes, the Mattress Ranch gets some shine when the PSA plays on television, but due to the personal connection with causes like cystic fibrosis and the food bank, Ted feels blessed to have the ability to be a part of the cause at this point in his life. And the food bank's a strong entity with me because I went so hungry so many years of my life that as a kid I uh, was on my own at 15 and uh, got married at 22, 21 or 22, and uh, until then I was hungry. I know what it's like to sleep in uh, abandoned cars. I know what it's like to go from one house to the next house to the next house and um, whatever. But uh, again, I don't look at that as anything except a trial and tribulation. So um, if you're strong, you get over it. And um, a lot of these people need help, and that's what the food banks are doing. Hopefully is helping them to get over. But I also help that the people that pick up at the food banks also realize that they've got to give too. They've got to um, be as productive as they possibly can be. Now, Ted appreciates charity, but being a strong-willed man that's escaped the streets himself, he holds people accountable for their actions. The early years of Ted not only laid the foundations for charities that he would support, but also the foundation was laid for his spirit of adventure. Being a street kid, it is difficult and it's not difficult. If you have a brain big enough to know not to get into trouble and not to carry a switchblade, then you're fine. If your brain says that I should carry a switchblade, you got trouble coming. My brain was big enough to hustle and keep moving on. I was at Woodstock. I was at Haight-Ashbury. Um, uh, I hitchhiked across the country during the time of uh, all the riots and the troubles and uh, whatever. I didn't have a problem. With a positive attitude, Ted thrived in life. And to this day, Ted prefers traveling the North American highways as opposed to flying on airplanes. A man worth millions of dollars drives to Alaska to handle business. Because so I sleep in my own bed because I have a phobia about sleeping in somebody else's. Oh. You want to know the real truth? Yeah. First time I ever said that one. Really? I have not slept in any bed but my own because I take my bed with me. When I go to Arizona, I take my bed. When I go to Alaska, I take my bed. So, um, and I don't know why, and, it, and it's not the reason I'm in the mattress business, but I like my own bed. Uh, I feel good. I wake up happy, um, and I don't understand why. Some call him eccentric, but he's honest and fun-loving. Ted truly is a local business icon, and his story is one that most every blue-collar, red-blooded American can relate to. Behind every strong man is a strong family. And coming up, we pull back the curtains on the inner workings of Ted's family and management of the Mattress Ranch. Hi, Ted Sadler. Welcome back. I'm John Thompson. Now you've heard the story of Ted's early life. Ted Sadler, you know that he's a philanthropist. You know he's an incredible businessman, marketing genius. You know that he's self-made and he's done it a couple times over. He's fallen down and he's done it again. Well, one of the reasons he's most successful, especially at the age of 60, coming up to Alaska and really kicking the mattress ranch into full gear, his family. He surrounded himself with the people he trusts and loves. And man, it could not have worked out any better on any level for Ted Sadler. Big things that I've learned uh, from Ted is to get up every day and do the best you can. If you do that, you set yourself up for success tomorrow. And then tomorrow you get up and do the best you can, you set yourself up for success for the following day. And it will keep building in that fashion. It doesn't necessarily mean that everything is a linear progression up. Sometimes it's a very large crash down. But you've set yourself up to do your absolute best and that's all you can ask of yourself. These days, Ted's son Max runs the business. Now, early in Max's life, Ted wasn't always around. He was out hustling, selling, promoting the brand, and trying to provide for his family. These days, totally different story. Ted's family is his business. Earlier, we mentioned a one-year contract agreed to by Ted and Max. Uh, my son Max um, has never really known another job. He, uh, when he was 17 years old to 20 years old, he was out on his own and he did various different things. And one day he said, hey, I want to come back and work with you and I'll give it a year's trial. And if it works, at the end of a year, I'll let you know. Uh, he said, I think there might be more opportunity with you than there is out here. 
Well, at the end of a year, nothing was said. Uh, at that time, Ted was, uh, this very store that we're in right now, he was uh, remodeling it, and I uh, flew down at well, one o'clock in the morning, and uh, the next day it was here at eight. Uh, uh, I like to think I was doing, using a jackhammer that day, but it might have been a couple days later. Uh, and we were tearing apart this place. It used to be a lumber yard and remodeled it, uh, did a whole bunch of the work ourselves. Well, Ted would teach Max the basics of Hustle 101. Learning from and getting quality time with his dad eventually led him to the love of his life. Then Max got married, and he married somebody that was already in the business that understood how to manage stores. She had come from a background of managing a, a dozen stores, so she had an ability that neither Max or I had. I think my, my part was helping develop the employees and the program for that to help us move forward um, and to allow Ted and Max to grow the company, pull them out of the stores, so to develop um, all the employees so that we had full-time people working. <laughs> Everything clicks with the family, each executing their roles to perfection and the mattress ranch is thriving. The business model includes not micromanaging employees, but holding them accountable. Management spends a lot of time together, and we mean a lot of time together. Ted and Susan, Max and Yvonne all live in the loft on top of the mattress ranch in Port Orchard. We're very We're close right together and, and all yeah, right here. Like right there, it was an adjustment. Yeah. <laughs> it was an adjustment, but it, we made it work. Um, we respect each other's privacy, um, which is, a, is number one, and um, it's actually worked out really well. Um, my family actually lives right up the road, so I mean, it's all, <laughs> I can't escape. No, it's good. <laughs> With the true family business and mattress production right here in the USA, the Saddlers run a top-notch operation that they are and should be very proud of, and it all starts with trust at the top. If you work with the best and believe that you're the best, you have to believe it. Um, and if it's true, why not believe it? If you try as hard as you possibly can, if you get up every day and you make your bed and you take a shower and you brush your teeth and you try as hard as you possibly can, there's not a whole bunch more you can do beyond that. And everybody's different. So best is really easy to achieve if you just keep going after it. And those positive vibes trickle down from the top, and it must. There's 11 stores, 11 mattress ranches in the Pacific Northwest, and the day-to-day -day operations can seem quite daunting. Again, everyone has a role. Max and Yvonne handle human services, product development, design and motifs, while Ted does the commercials and the advertising buy. But we run the rest of the thing, the day-to-day -day operation. And what we found is we, we now have a general manager, which he just hired just a couple years ago, to take some of the, the load off of ourselves and that we get a good person in each store. As long as you, have, you start out with one good person, that person will then weed out if there's somebody else that you hire that's maybe not so good. Um, if you can get two good people in a store, everything's golden. Uh, it's, it's really important to hire the right people to get somebody with a positive attitude who wants to be there that understands that it's uh, something that's beneficial to them. But once you can find those people, then the stores run uh, a lot uh, on their own. They're almost autonomous. Not quite, but almost. Now Max is going to let us in on a little science to keeping the stores stocked for customers of all sorts of needs all the time, something that Ted takes great pride if in. If you're laying on 12 or 15 beds uh, in, a, in a day trying to determine what you think your customers are going to like down the road, maybe two months down the road, it's a difficult thing to do. But we try to make sure that we have enough variety at enough price points that is go something is going to be there for everybody who comes through the door. With an amazing family and successful business, Ted Sadler is on top of the world. Fall, get up, fall, and get up again. He showed his adversaries that he could thrive business-wise in the state of Alaska. He's had enough life experience for the entire state of Alaska and cherishes the opportunity to give back to the community. So to what does Ted owe all of this success? Definitely luck, without luck. I'd, I'd, I'd rather be standing next to the intelligent, excuse me, to the lucky guy than the intelligent guy. Uh, a lot of times the intelligent guy doesn't necessarily always win with the battle he has, but that lucky guy's got luck. In our chain of command of work, if we don't have the man that unloads, if we don't have the lady that checks them in, if we don't have the guy that sells it, if we don't have the buyer, if we don't have the TV, all of those things out of whack, then your business doesn't work. And it took me longer than most to get that going. I had to wait till my son grew up to, um, to do it. 
Um, so anyway, that's kind of my history. To me, it's, it's the reward. It, uh, there is no end, it's only the trip. The end is, means end. Trip means that you're on the way there and having a good time. And I'm, having, I'm on a trip, and I'm always on a trip, and I want to keep tripping. So um, what can I say? Well, we do truly hope you enjoyed the last hour or so of the Ted Sadler Mattress Ranch Guy story. I mean, what an incredible story it was. And I mean, hopefully we answered a couple questions for you. A lot of people wondered, why did Ted leave Alaska after establishing Sadler's in the 80s? Because that was obviously, to this day, a very popular brand and uh, very popular around town. Hopefully you got that question answered. Also, why did he come back in 2004 at the age of 60 years old? What did he have left to prove? Or what did he feel he had to prove? had a lot to prove. The man had fallen down and the man does take great pride in his business and his family and uh, what he does and who he is. Had a lot of great life experiences. He's an incredible guy. He's got a lot of great antidotes. Things that'll turn your frown upside down and things that make you think a little bit about life and why we're here and what we're doing. Ted Sadler, a businessman, a marketing genius, and a philanthropist. Hope you enjoyed the story tonight. We've truly enjoyed telling you that story. We hope you have a wonderful evening. And if you gotta buy a mattress, We'll, we'll leave that up to you.